Hi students, Professor Gray again. Let's talk about the octet rule. So last time we learned that elements would like to have eight valence electrons. And for the main group elements, this means that you've got two electrons in your S and six in your P. And we can see that our noble gases over here all have eight valence electrons, which makes them really stable. The anomaly is helium up here, and it has a duet instead of an octet, and that's because the 1s orbital can only hold two electrons, and then it's full. So how the other elements are going to get eight valence electrons is they're going to go around trying to steal electrons or give their electrons away, whichever one is easier. And if we take a look at the bottom picture, you guys can see that we've got the element sodium. And sodium has one valence electron. You can see it right here. It's at one electron in the 3s subshell. And sodium's going to want to get rid of that extra electron so that it can have eight electrons in its valence shell. And that would be equivalent to neon. So if sodium gets rid of this one electron, it goes backwards to having the electron configuration of neon right there. And that would mean it would get rid of that little guy right there. And you guys can see that then it would have eight and then it would be happy. But what happens when that happens? Well, if we go back to this slide, you guys can see that sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. So what we have is plus 11 and minus 11, because remember protons are plus one and electrons are minus one. Now, if we get rid of this one electron, what's going to happen is we're still going to have 11 protons because if you're sodium, you have to have 11 protons, but now we're going to have 10 electrons. So right here, loss of one electron. And over here we have a plus 11 and we have negative 10. And if we put those together, we're going to have a total charge or net charge of plus one. And we can see that that's written right there, the sodium with the superscript plus, and if you don't see a number next to the plus, we're gonna assume that it's one. Any other number, two, three, four, and you're gonna have to write the number there. So again, why sodium goes from the sodium atom to the sodium cation is for stability because it wants to have an octet. Now, cation right there, that is an ion that has a positive charge. And when introductory students are first reading that word, they tend to say cation, but it's not cation, it's cation. Now an ion, which is an atom that's charged, that has a negative charge will be called an anion. And we will see that very soon. So just to write it again, when sodium loses one of its electrons, it'll become sodium plus one or just sodium with a plus. Cause again, if there's no number next to it, we assume it's a one or sometimes you guys will see sodium and it'll say one plus plus one or one plus, same thing for our purposes. All righty, switching on over to chlorine. Chlorine is right here, 17 protons and 17 electrons. And if we talk about valence electrons like we did in the last lecture, group 7A, which is group 17, is gonna have seven valence electrons. And it desperately wants to have eight because everybody wants to have eight. 
because it wants to be like the cool kid right next to it, argon. And so what sodium is going to do, sorry, not sodium, chlorine, what chlorine is going to do is it's going to look to steal an electron from somebody. You guys can see right here that the Lewis dot structure for chlorine tells us that we've got seven valence electrons. And chlorine's going to want that eighth valence electron really bad. And we see that again down here. So it steals an electron from somebody else and it goes from 17 protons and 17 electrons to 17 protons and 18 electrons. So remember the protons are plus one and electrons are negative one. That gives us a net charge of what? Minus one. And how we write that is down here. So the Lewis dot structure, you would see eight electrons around that chlorine right there. And then you would put a minus symbol in a superscript to indicate that it has a net charge of minus one. Now you can just write it with the minus or you can write it with the minus one. Or a lot of times you'll see it with the one minus. And also most of the time you won't see those dots drawn in because if it says chlorine with a minus one, we assume that you know that it has eight valence electrons now. So right here, chlorine has captured an electron and now it has the electron configuration of the nearest noble gas, argon. So it has the same clothes that argon has and it can pretend that it's a cool kid. Now, one more thing. When the chlorine atom turns into the chlorine ion, it gets a name change. It goes from chlorine to chloride. And we'll talk about that name change a lot more when we get to the nomenclature section, which is coming up really soon. Also, anion, again, that's an ion, and an ion is a charged atom. So it means it has a plus or minus charge. If it's an ion with a minus charge, it's called an anion. Okay, so now that we know why things would have a positive charge and why things would have a negative charge, we can talk about ionic bonding. So again, you guys, ions, the definition for that, those are atoms that have a charge, and that's due to gain or loss of electrons. Now remember, the number of protons don't change because we identify our atoms by the number of protons, so those stay the same. But you can change the number of electrons uh, pretty much all you want, and it's okay. And an anion is a negatively charged ion or a negatively charged atom. And a cation is a positively charged ion, or you can say a positively charged atom. Now, an ionic bond. This is a bond that's formed by attraction. So what causes the attraction is the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom to another atom. So one atom is going to be positively charged and another atom is going to be negatively charged. So you have oppositely charged atoms or oppositely charged ions and opposites attract. So if you have a sodium right here that wants to get rid of a valence electron desperately, it's like, oh, I just need to unload this thing. And along comes a chlorine, and the chlorine desperately wants an extra electron. Well, that's a really good situation because sodium can go ahead and take this electron and say, here, have it, chlorine. And then we get the sodium cation and the chlorine anion, which is called the chloride ion or just chloride or a chloride anion. And what you'll see is that the sodium cation and the chloride anion 
they both have eight valence electrons, two in their outermost S's and six in their outermost P's. So two plus six makes eight. And eight is an octet, that's the magic number. Now, because this one is positively charged and this one is negatively charged, they're attracted to each other. And that is an ionic bond. The attraction of oppositely charged ions to each other that keeps them together. Now, for another view on sodium chloride, we can take a look at this slide, just in case you didn't like the previous slide. Here's exactly the same information again. So it's showing you right here that sodium has this one valence electron that it wants to get rid of so that it can go backwards and have the electron configuration of the previous noble gas right here, neon. Now the question might be, why didn't it want to have the electron configuration of argon? Well, sodium would have to pick up seven extra electrons to have the electron configuration of argon. So in this outermost shell, it'd have to pick up seven electrons. That's a whole lot more work than just dumping that one electron and going backwards and having the electron configuration of neon. So that's why that happens. And then chlorine, it's like, woohoo, let me pick up that extra electron. And it does that. And again, it is going to have the electron configuration of argon. Now, why didn't chlorine go backwards to neon? Well, it would have had to lose seven electrons to go back to the electron configuration of neon. So it'd have to lose these seven. And that's way more work than just finding one to make eight. All right, so the other ways you guys will see this written right here. Sometimes we have brackets around our ions and we have the charges on the outside. So sometimes you'll see that written like that, the picture above my writing, or you might see something like this. There's a lot of different versions of this, or you might see just any plus and Cl minus next to each other. Or as we will see in the formula writing section that we're coming up on, sometimes we just put them right next to each other and assume you know there's charges there, but you don't see them. Now, because these are charged, many sodium ions and chlorides are gonna be attracted to each other and they're going to build up into a crystal. And we like this because then we get salt crystals and we can grind those down into a powder and put them all over our food and it makes everything taste better. But what that looks like in the crystal is a whole lot of sodiums and a whole lot of chlorides. But the lowest ratio of a sodium ion to a chloride is one to one. And that's symbolized right here. So the lowest ratio, and that's called a formula unit. So when we write sodium chloride like this, we're not only assuming the charges because we just learned them, and you guys will get really good at this, but we're also assuming that the subscripts down there are one. When we don't see a number, we assume it's one. So the lowest number ratio for sodium chloride is one to one. Okay, now how do we know what charges things are gonna do in a really easy way? Instead of writing out the electron configuration and trying to figure out is it gonna gain electrons or lose electrons from the electron configuration, there's a few shortcuts. And one of them is to use this slide. So when you guys are doing your book work or your online homework, I would suggest you have this slide as well as the periodic table very handy. And what we'll see is that 
atoms in group one or group A. So remember, group one and group one A are the same thing. These guys are gonna do plus one. Elements in group two or group two A, these right here, they're gonna do plus two because they wanna lose two electrons to go back to the electron configuration of the previous noble gas. And if you get rid of two of your negatives, your net charge is gonna be plus two. Now beryllium up here, don't worry about beryllium. It's kind of small and it does something weird on its own and we'll see beryllium later. I want you guys to skip on over to group 13, which is also called 3A. And you need to know that aluminum does plus three. Now I'm gonna work my way backwards and I'm gonna start with group 18 or 8A. Now, these are your noble gases and so they're gonna have a duet or an octet. So they are happy. So we have to ask ourselves, do they want to lose or gain any electrons? No, they are happy. So that's why you guys see that none of them have charges there. Moving backwards to group 17 or 7A, these are our halogens and our halogens are gonna be charged negative one. So sometimes hydrogen, instead of doing plus one, will do minus one and that's because it picks up an electron instead of losing one, and that's called a hydride. You guys won't see that very often. If you go on to take organic chemistry, you'll see hydrides, but for us, we are going to focus on these guys right here. So when they have a minus one charge, Instead of being called fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they're called fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. So you need to know that those ones do minus one. And you guys should have that in your head by the time you're done with the homework for this section. Because when you go on to do the online assignment, the quiz, and the test, it'll really help you to be familiar with that. Backing up to group 6a or 16 specifically oxygen and sulfur those like to do minus two and again i mentioned sometimes minus two is written as two minus and don't worry about that for our purposes in introductory chemistry it's the same thing now why do these do minus two well they're trying to pick up two extra electrons so that they can have a noble gas configuration like this guy over here. And if you have two more electrons and you have protons, you're gonna have a net charge of minus two. Backing up to group 15 or 5A, nitrogens and phosphoruses. Those are gonna go minus three. And when nitrogen turns into an anion, it's called nitride. And that's one that you guys should just be familiar with because we're going to use it a lot. Now, the things in the middle over here, the transition metals, I'm not going to ask you guys to memorize those ones. You would be given a chart on a test or an exam if you're to use those. And what I want you guys to notice is that there are a few of them that do different charges. And those are called variable charges. So some, day, some days iron wakes up and it wants to do plus two, and some days it wakes up and it wants to do plus three. So it can do a couple of different things. Copper, copper is right here. Copper can do plus one some days, and then some days it'll do plus two. And we will learn how to figure out which is which in our compounds when we're given a name. All right, so now that we learned about ions, cations and anions, let's learn about putting those together. 
So ionic compounds, we're going to put oppositely charged ions together and have them be held together by attraction. And the first way we will see this is with a metal and a non-metal. Now the most basic example of this is putting sodium, which is a metal, together with chlorine, which is a non-metal, and creating sodium chloride. So you guys see there how sodium chloride is written without subscripts and without superscripts. So what we assume that you can figure out at this point is there's one sodium for every chloride and we figure you can do the charges by now too. So what you don't see is that it's a sodium cation with a chloride anion because when you write the formula you don't write the charges. The next thing you guys will see is a metal and a polyatomic ion. So here we have the metal sodium and we have the polyatomic ion nitrate. Now poly means what? Many, that's right. And atomic means atoms. So we have our metal, sodium, and we have our polyatomic ion, nitrate. Now that charge of minus one belongs to the entire nitrate. And a nitrate is always a, a nitrogen with three oxygens, and that minus one charge is shared by the whole thing. So we can think about this as a whole package. So that's that, and that's that. So we have a monatomic ion, so mono meaning one right there, and we have a polyatomic ion right there, sodium nitrate. And again, notice that the formula for sodium nitrate is not written with the charges there. We just assume that you know them, and by the end of this class, you will be very good at knowing them. Now, the next example of an ionic compound is a polyatomic ion plus a nonmetal. The polyatomic ion here is the cation. That is ammonium, not ammonia the cleaner, which is NH3, but ammonium. And that entire package, the whole NH4 together, has a charge of plus one. So that's the entire package together, polyatomic ion. And then the nonmetal is just our plain old chloride anion. And again, you guys, the formula is written without charges. We assume that you know that ammonium is plus one and chloride is minus one. Now at this point you're probably like, what? Why are you assuming that I know these things? Because you're learning them and what you'll have available to you is a chart where you can look it up. Now the last example on this slide is a polyatomic ion and a polyatomic ion. And we've seen both of these polyatomic ions above. So the first polyatomic ion, the cation portion, is ammonium, and that's plus one. And the polyatomic anion is nitrate, and that's minus one. Now, the next bullet point tells you that the charges have to be uh, net zero. So notice here that you have a plus one and here you have minus one. So that gives, uh, gives us a net charge of zero. And that also tells us that we only need one of each. We only need one ammonium and we only need one nitrate. If you had two ammoniums and one nitrate, that would give you plus two because each ammonium would give you plus one. And if you only had one nitrate, that would be minus one. And plus two and minus one makes a net charge of plus one, so that wouldn't work. So we need one of each. And you guys can see 
that we have one of each there. Okay, the chart for polyatomic ions. And what you guys should be very familiar with. So the positively charged polyatomic ion that you will see most in this class is ammonium. So you guys should know that one. Cyanide's a good one to know. Carbonate is a really good one to know. So that's CO3 and a minus two or two minus. You guys should also know sulfite and sulfate. You'll use those ones a lot, as well as nitrite and nitrate. Another one that's used quite often is phosphate. So my dog is drinking some water just in case you're like, what is that noise in the background? So those are the ones you guys should be familiar with. The rest of them, if I asked you to use them, I would probably give you a chart. Now let's take a look at oxy anions. I've also seen them called oxo anions, but I've never seen somebody use that. Now these are polyatomic ions that look very similar. So if you take a look at the charts, you'll be like, whoa very similar. We just changed the numbers of oxygens. So if you look at the names, you'll notice that the endings are either eight or eight. And if you look at sulfate and sulfite, you'll see you have SO4 minus two and SO3 minus two. Same charges, both have a sulfur, both have oxygens, just one has four oxygens and the other one has three. So the numbers of oxygens must be doing something to the name ending. And then you look at the next ones and you'll see that phosphate and phosphite look a whole lot like sulfate and sulfite. So you have PO4 minus three and PO3 minus three. And so by that point you might think, okay, the things that end in eight, they must have four oxygens and the things that end in eight, they must have three oxygens because that looks like what's going on here. And then we take a look at nitrate and nitrite and we can see, uh, that doesn't fit. The, the eight has three oxygens and the eight has two oxygens in that set. Okay, here's the thing about eight and eight. When you have oxyanions in a set, the eight refers to the fact that this is the one in the set that has more oxygens. And the eight says this is the one in the set that has fewer oxygens. So for sulfate and sulfite, the eight is four oxygens and the eight is three oxygens. Whereas for nitrate and nitrite, the eight is three oxygens and the eight is two oxygens. So that's how that works. Now, what happens if you have an eight and an eight and you find a member of this set that has even more oxygens? Well, you keep the name here. So you keep the name for chlorate here, and then you just add a prefix. You add per on there. So you take chlorate and you plot per on the front, and that's telling you that you've got one more oxygen. Now what happens if you find a member of this set that has one fewer oxygens than your ite? Well, what you do is you take the name for the guy that ends in ite, and you keep it, and you stick hypo on the front. And hypo means what? It means under. Like a hypodermic needle is under the skin, okay? So chlorite had two oxygens, and hypochlorite has how many? You don't see the subscript there. So if you don't see a number, you assume it's what? One, good. Okay, so that's how we do that set right there. This guy up here, 
that is the Lewis dot structure for sulfate. So that's SO4 minus two. And this one right here, that is the Lewis dot structure for PO4 minus three, and that is which oxyanion? Phosphate. The Lewis dot structures for whole ions or molecules we'll do later on in this chapter. We've just done Lewis dot structures for single atoms so far, but we'll get there. All right, so that brings us to rules for naming ionic compounds. So the first rule for naming ionic compounds says that we name the cation by its elemental or polyatomic name. So if we have this right here, that compound, we name the cation first, and we just name it by its elemental name, which is sodium. So you guys don't want to say sodium cation. You just say sodium. And number two says, if the metal is a transition metal with a variable charge, so remember that was this middle section right here that's the transition metals, and the ones with the variable charges are like iron and copper, where sometimes they're plus one or plus two, and then sometimes they're plus two or plus three, depending on which element they are. What we're gonna do is we're gonna indicate that charge, whether it would be plus two or plus three if we had iron, with Roman numerals in parentheses. But sodium is not a transition metal with a variable charge. Sodium always does plus one when it goes to an ion. So we don't have to do anything about that with sodium. So the next thing says we're going to change the ending of the anion to ide. So chlorine, when it's just regular old Cl, has an ene ending. And when we change it to the anion, the ene ending changes to ide. So that would take us to sodium chloride as the name for NaCl. Now, if you have a polyatomic ion, you do not change the ending. You don't change it to I. You just leave the ending as is. And let me go back to this slide right here to show you why. Now, NO2 is nitrite and NO3 is nitrate. If you change that ending to nitride, you would no longer mean NO3 or NO2. What you would mean is the monatomic ion that comes from nitrogen, and that's minus three. So back here, right here, notice that nitrogen, when it goes to an anion becomes minus three. So be very careful with that one and do not change the ending on your polyatomic ions. Leave them as eight or eight. If you change it to eight, you're changing it into something else. Okay, so for ionic compounds, compounds that are composed of ions, we do not use the prefixes mono, di, tri, etc. to indicate how many of each atom are present. So if you have MgCl2, you do not call that magnesium dichloride, you just call that magnesium chloride. And the charges will allow you to figure out how many of each ion you have when you go to write the formula. And we'll see that when we do some problems. 
So the first problem here says, go ahead and write the name for Ki. So what is K? That's potassium. And that is our metal, that is our cation. So we don't have to change the name on that. We just write potassium. Now I is what? It's iodine. So iodine is going to go to iodide. So iodine is just our I, and iodide is I minus one. So we have potassium iodide there. And how did I know that my iodide was minus one? Well, if you have this chart handy, you'll see that iodine is a halogen, and when it goes to its ionic form, it's gonna be minus one. All right, MgBr2. Mg is magnesium, and we don't need to change that name. So we have magnesium. And we have two bromines there, but since this is ionic, we're not going to say how many we have. We're just going to name the anion. So bromine goes to what when it becomes an anion? Bromide. So we have magnesium bromide. Okay, number three, Al2O3. Al is which cation? That is aluminum. Now, if you're part of the British Commonwealth, you'll probably say aluminium because that's how they say it. And just as a review, you guys, aluminum and ionic compound is going to be doing plus three, and oxygen is going to be doing minus two. So back here, we've got aluminum and we have oxygens. Now, oxygen, It doesn't have an I-N-E ending like bromine or iodine or chlorine. So this one we kind of have to guess a little bit at it, but when it changes from oxygen, the neutral atom, to oxygen, the anion, it goes from a neutral charge to a minus two charge and its name goes from oxygen to oxide. So we've got aluminum oxide there. Now number four, what is Fe? That's the metal iron. So right here we've got iron and we have the anion chloride. But I wrote a space between there because we're missing something. The rules say if you have a metal with a, sorry, if you have a transition metal with a variable charge, you need to indicate which charge it's doing. So back on our chart here, we can see that irons like to go plus two or plus three. So how do we know which one plus one or plus two iron chloride FeCl2 is doing today? Well, we have to look at the charge on our chloride. So chlorides are always gonna do minus one. And how did I know that? Well, I used my chart. Chlorides right there always do minus one. And if you have two of them, this is gonna give you a total negative charge of negative two. Now remember, in an ionic compound, you need to have a net neutral charge. A neutral compound is a happy compound. So that means that your iron is gonna do what? Plus two or plus three? It's gonna do plus two today because plus two and minus two, when you add those up, give 
a neutral charge. And again, a neutral compound is a happy compound. So how we indicate to our reader that iron is doing plus two today is we put the charge in parentheses and we write it as a Roman numeral. So this is iron two chloride. Now that two right there, that does not indicate how many irons you have. This is not Fe2. That right there, that Roman numeral is the charge on iron. So an iron two would be written like this if you were just to write an iron two on its own to indicate that it's a plus two charge. So we've got iron two chloride there. Okay, number five. Number five is CaSO4. Now when you're looking at naming this one, you might say calcium sulfur tetraoxide. Oh my gosh, there's too many atoms here. Now if that happens to you, a little bell should go off in your head and say ding, 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 ding. I probably got a polyatomic ion here somewhere. And you should do what? Look at your polyatomic ion sheet and see if you can find it. So if we look at our polyatomic ion sheet, we might be able to spot our sulfate, SO4 and minus two. Now again, when you're writing formulas, you don't see the charges there. We expect that you can figure that out. So following the rules, we would go ahead and name the metal, name the cation as its name. So we have calcium. And so we've named the calcium. And now we have to name the polyatomic ion. And remember the rule for naming the polyatomic ion is that you do not change the ending. So we just leave it as sulfate. You do not change it to sulfide. Do not do that. Because a sulfide is an S minus two, just a plain old monatomic ion there. So don't do that. Leave it as sulfate because it's a polyatomic ion. And the rules say that if the ion is polyatomic, we do not change the ending. Okay, number six. We've got BA, and that is barium. And then we have parentheses around an NO2. The parentheses are telling you that you've got more than one polyatomic ion. So it's saying I've got this package. I've got NO2. How many of them do I have? I've got two of them. I have two NO2s. Each NO2 is charged minus one. And how on earth do I know that? Because I've been doing this for decades. But if you were to check that, you might go to this chart and go, okay, that is a nitrate. And it tells me right there that I have minus one for my charge. So I have barium nitrate. Now, why did I need two nitrates and only one barium? Well, if I look back on this chart right here, I can see that barium is gonna do plus two. So if I draw this in blob form, we can imagine it like this. You got barium plus two, and then your nitrate is gonna be minus one. So you would have NO2 minus one there, but a plus two and a minus one doesn't make a neutral charge, so you need a second one. So you have plus two and minus one and minus one. And if you have minus one plus minus one plus a positive two, you're gonna get a net charge of what? Of zero and a neutral compound is a happy compound. 
Okay, and how we indicate that we have two packages of NO2 again is we put parentheses around it and we put a two down here on the outside. Now, just to make it clear, you cannot write two NO2s as N2O4. That's a completely different thing. You have to say, I've got two nitrates. And how you do that, excuse me, nitrite. Hopefully I've been saying nitrite this whole time and not nitrate, bad teacher, bad. Okay, so nitrates. You have to say I have two nitrates by putting the parentheses around it. So I've got that package and I have two of them. All righty, so barium nitrate it is. Now number seven. Number seven, we've got copper. Now copper is a transition metal with a variable charge. Copper is over here. Sometimes it can do plus one, sometimes it can do plus two. And when you have a variable charge, you have to put which charge it is in the name. So we'll just go ahead and we'll write copper. And then we know we have to indicate which charge it is, one or two, using Roman numerals. And then we need to have the anion on the end. Now NO3, NO3 is nitrate. So we can go ahead and write nitrate on the end over here because we know when we have a polyatomic, we don't change the ending. Also, in the name, we do not need to indicate how many nitrates we have. We do that, and we have to do that with the formula. So again, the parentheses around the NO3 say it's this specific package, and the little two down here will tell you there's two. But when you write the name, you don't say there's two nitrates, you just say nitrate. Now, nitrates, those are always gonna be charged minus one. So if I draw this out in blob form, so we can get a visual on this, we've got copper and we have a couple of nitrates. Now here we have minus one and we want to add to it a positive something and we're adding to that another minus one that comes from this guy, and we need the charge to equal zero. So the question is, is it copper one, which would be plus one, or is it copper two, which would be plus two? And the answer is it's copper two. So we want a plus two or a two plus up there. Remember, it doesn't matter for us because minus one plus positive two plus minus one makes a net charge that's neutral, and a neutral compound is a happy compound. Okay, so that means that this plus two, we're gonna indicate it right there in Roman numerals, and we're gonna say that this is copper two nitrate. Now again, that two indicates a charge. It does not mean you have two coppers. It means you have copper and it's charged plus two. Okay, I think that's enough for now. I'm gonna upload this and we'll continue on uh, later on. And I will see you guys then. Stay healthy and bye for now.